Hello, beloveds. Welcome to the Amanda Collins podcast. It's my honor to help you awaken to joy, be your greatest self, and live a life you love. I'm Amanda Collins. Each week, I'll share tips, practices, and rituals to help you feel the storehouse of joy inside. I'll answer your questions and talk with thought leaders from around the world about health, wealth, love, conscious living, and parenting. Are you ready to live your most fulfilled life? In this episode, we'll talk about what happens when parents have different approaches to parenting, how to create a more peaceful home, how to understand your child when they don't even know how to express how they're feeling, what to do when your children are fighting, and how to honor their emotions. Genevieve runs the Peaceful Parent Institute in New Zealand, which offers seminars, workshops, and e-courses for parents and educators, professional development for teachers, as well as one-on-one counseling and coaching. Genevieve has a diploma in psychosynthesis counseling and a certified aware parenting instructor. She's a writer for the Natural Parent magazine and has a busy following of 88,000 people on her Facebook page and blog. Genevieve, being one of nine siblings, grew up on a farm in Wexford. Despite living in a very dysfunctional family, She found peace, excitement, and healing in the natural world. And this has hugely influenced her work. Genevieve has facilitated hundreds of workshops and residential retreats over the last 26 years on parenting, relationships, personal development, self-healing, Another big focus of the retreats has been immersion into nature, mindfulness, eating wholesome vegetarian food, and generally slowing down and regaining balance. Welcome, Genevieve. I am so, so honored to have you here today. And the work that you do in the world is so vital for our children, our next generation. And I love having you here, um, knowing that you're a, a fellow Irish sister from actually Wexford, where I'm um, calling in from right now. So great to connect with you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. And especially an honor and exciting because we're from the same neck of the woods. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, so yeah, I'm delighted to come on the show and um, and have a chat. Mm. Well, thank you. And I'd love to just start off with what exactly um, is it that you, you share on a day-to-day basis to help yeah. par- with parenting? Yeah, sure. And thank you for your very kind words about um, you know, the work that I do. So to try and sum it up, I, um, I guess on a day-to-day um, basis, I'm mostly working one-on-one with parents. I'm, a, I'm both a counsellor, a psychosynthesis counsellor, and also a parent educator. So I'm doing a lot of one-on-one, both face-to-face, also through Skype, uh, working with moms, dads, couples, um, sometimes with the children as well. Um, uh, and teenagers Um, although I do like to put the main focus on helping the parents because it's the it's the it's the parents or the caregivers whoever the caregivers are they are the ones that that child needs that um, that relationship to to be at the best it can be and to be improved so I like to equip parents with the skills and also I you know do a lot of online work I um, for really for about 25 years, I've been running workshops and talks and including, you know, weekend residential self-healing retreats that I ran, you know, there in Ireland and England for many, many, many years and for quite a few years after I moved here to New Zealand. And so in more recent years, I just have been more doing seminars and workshops for parents and teachers and particularly early childhood teachers um, and also you know I run e-courses and have a membership 
forum and a, a membership area that's got resources and e-courses and um, forums and um, you know the place of support and learning for parents and that really came Amanda out of uh, that online presence you have more and more people finding me through my website and obviously as the the hunger and the thirst for this um, this more compassionate approach has grown and then people just find you and then obviously through my Facebook page people find me I've also got a, a secret Q&A um, on Facebook has got seven and a half thousand members that's very 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 active and so that's you know that that's, it's a lot of work to manage that but I have an amazing team of admins and um, some of them trained peaceful parenting mentors and uh, most you know mostly they're just they're just giving their time volunteer volunteering voluntarily for the cause because they are equally passionate about uh, answering parents questions and equipping them with skills and approaches and just as much as that Amanda it's the empathy the understanding the support that we get it and you know when we hear that person saying I'm just really failing then you know we're going to respond with wow it sounds like you're really struggling at the moment and how can we help so does that kind of I, I, it's not a very short sum up but it's probably the shortest I could I could give just to give a sense of what I do Mm, it's so beautiful. Just just hearing that peaceful parenting is like, oh, so thank you for the work that you do. And I'm, I'm so excited to be here together today. And um, I feel like I'd love to just kind of get stuck in uh, for yeah. some questions. And, uh, okay. you know, um, and a lot of them are just kind of even personal ones with my children as, as we had in our conversation before. I've got like yeah. my little girl just turned three and my little boy will be four in August. And, mm. um, you know, I think a couple of things that like were always so clear for me before they're born. It's like I just really because I feel like it's a journey for adults to get back to connected to self-love and self-worth. Oh, yes. So, yeah. yeah yeah, and, and to listening to that inner voice. So always kind of my main intention was, is, with my children, is to allow them to stay connected to their inner voice, um, mm. to, to play, stay, stay connected to that innate self-love and knowing, you know, your self-worth from the moment you're born. And then it's so interesting because um, as, you know, you're in the day-to-day -day and, you know, there's just constantly meals to be cooked and dishes to be done and you know clothes and then it's just like it, it's like you always almost want to be re-reminding yourself of that and um yeah. so like I think the first thing would be okay so while supporting the ch child to listen to their inner voice and mm -hmm. allow them you know it's like you hear people say I want a child that is it like a you know a natural born leader and you know later on but right now they have to listen so it's like to me it's almost like there's a discrepancy like yeah, if you think you're going to do that <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for and, and for me I'm like okay so that's ultimately my intention but what happens and um, when they're just absolutely not listening and mm -hmm. you like okay okay and obviously safety wise that's kind of non-negotiable you know run out in front of a car or any of that you know but what happens when you know yeah exactly but you have to get somewhere or something has to be done um but you're like i want to support their inner leader but they have to listen so what are some tools for the parents out there oh yes gosh so many so many great points amanda that you've just that you've just shared there and it speaks just volumes about your values and your goals as a parent and uh yeah some really beautiful principles that you're that you're holding and uh, which brings me right back to the beginning of my journey of parenting and it was very 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 similar it was you know i really really want my children to um i, I want to not suppress them i want to not squash their that that energy that spirit that um, like innate curiosity, that the strong leadership, and um, and as you say, at the same time, parents are juggling all of these different needs and wants, and 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 any particular day, and fighting against the clock, and there's places that we have to be at a certain time, and it's all a lot to juggle, and it's very very hard to maintain that nice, peaceful, shanty, calm patient uh, tone of voice and and really 
tune into our children throughout a busy day when we're trying to achieve so much. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm just starting, Amanda, by saying, you know, I'm a parent as well. I've got my feet on the ground. It, it, it can sound very idealistic, peaceful parenting, but there is really practical solutions and approaches that um, do really, really answer these questions and help to juggle the difficulties, the stress, and get that, you talk about that tricky balancing act, aren't you, between yeah. <laughs> supporting them, to, yeah, to listen to their inner voice. We don't want to overpower them to the point where we're training them to always look to the approval of the authority figures or to be easily intimidated. We want the, the leadership um, and their self-authority to remain intact. Um, and yet, you know, we also we're the parents and we're the leader and we're seeing a whole host of things that they can't see. You talked about, you know, running out on the road, um, you know, the, the child is naturally impulsive. They don't have that impulse control. So it's equally not fair of us parents to expect them to have that impulse control. So we have to hold them and guide them and we do need to have boundaries and we do need to have limits. And I think this is, this is where it's particularly difficult and it takes a lot of skill to how do you hold boundaries and limits? How do you say no to certain things? How do you keep them safe what, um, in a way that doesn't damage the relationship or doesn't cause them shame and, and doesn't, um, uh, doesn't invite the rebellion and the defiance and, and all of that. Not because we're trying to be their best friend or anything like that, but it's just not necessary to use approaches that, um, that are so strong and forceful for the child that they, they've got no choice but to either submit or to fight back. And I think the authoritarian ways that I'll just boldly assume, Manda, that you grew up with, because I certainly didn't. You know, yeah. didn't be. <laughs> it's fair to assume, isn't it? And, um, you know, those, the, those old, old school, kind of the traditional ways of really pointing the finger and lecturing children and shaming them and saying, oh, there will be consequences. These are the punishments and all of that. It, it's, it's unnecessarily strong and forceful. And in a way, it's... Um, it's a it's an insult to the child that um, yeah, it's, absolutely. it's kind of assuming you are not going to take me seriously unless I get really forceful with you. But actually, our children, to our children, we're their superheroes. They love us. They lock up to us. They want um, they want things to be harmonious just as much as we do. Um, and so, uh, so I, I think you know, coming back to holding those, you know, the limits and the expectations and the, and the boundaries. I think what's so important is to, to do it in a way whereby ah, just some simple, some simple principles like first working to calm ourselves, get centered ourselves. Um, so say, you know, your kids are squabbling or whatever, just as you're walking towards that scene, then you know, you, Amanda, and me, you know, at that age and stage where my kids were, uh, where, you, where they were younger, the, the onus is on us to, uh, to gather our composure and to move into a strong, calm, confident place. I know that's a big ask, but the more we practice doing it, and if that's what our intention is, we just get better and better at doing it. So, so first of all, it's that getting centered, gathering our own composure, um, so that we become mindful of when the, the, the stress, the frustration, the anger, the exasperation is really taking us over. And, and we are doing something about that. We're taking a breath. We're slowing down. We're maybe speaking with a slower, calmer voice. Because, of course, when we get very stressed, we want to speak very fast and speak louder. And the, <laughs> the whites of our eyes and, you know, everything gets a bit intense. And so the more we can pull it back and speak more slowly, calmly, then we can get our child's attention. And then it's that thing of just getting their attention rather than just um, broadcasting at them or lecturing them. And so that can be coming down to their level, 
the the touch the affection the eye contact the you know bringing them in um and and also to bring them into our world we often need to enter their world first so maybe speaking to what we can imagine their thinking or feeling or you know we can only ever imagine but just showing them that we're we're trying to figure out say you're coming into that scene where the kids are having an argument oh kids this looks really stressful like just to start off like that is immediately conveying to them amanda that you're not just there to tell them off it's not just about them being in trouble with that you do actually want to help them and that starts to bring down their stress levels and if we can bring down their stress levels a little bit and show them that we're here to help then they've got a lot less reason to be reactive towards us and to push us away they're going to be more interested in what we have to say and then maybe okay kids can i get your attention i can see you're having a hard time let's just pause figuring this out for the moment and let me help you and maybe put a hand on both of them and what happens as you're putting your hand on them just makes all the difference in the world because often parents put their hand on their child in a way that's well it may not be rough or gruff but it might at least be quite tense and they feel that and they pick that up but if we can actually consciously mindfully relax our muscles and touch them in a way that's that's genuinely a bit more kind and um and supportive then that that touch has a very powerful effect on bringing down their stress levels um so is i'll just pause because i'm not just you know going on and on and on and making sure that you're with me so far amanda oh my gosh i'm like hanging on every word and i just like first of all i just so much is just so beautiful and i just first of all love when you said they ultimately want things to be as harmonious mm. as we do and I just like oh it's so true they do and they're just mm. they're they're just like all knowing <laughs> you know they're so yeah. wise and um and then you know <laughs> talk about gurus I don't believe I, I believe our mm -hmm. gurus within us but if anybody asks me like who my gurus are it's my children <laughs> because oh, you know absolutely. ultimately like they show yeah. us in seconds if we are out of balance and and really yeah. You know, it's like they do. They the, do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like to a pregnant woman or people that are planning to have children. It's like, well, let's first of all start doing our work, healing any old wounds, because the truth is they're going to show up big time when you start parenting. And um, I love that you said just you know breathe, center, get your own composure, um, because they're such empath and they they before they hear what you're saying before anything they're just feeling the energy so like if you're yeah. feeling stressed out so then, sensitive yeah it's, it's even like i'm sorry to compare it in any way but like pets horses because i was grew up with mm. horses it's like they just feel energy so you Absolutely. know yes, yes. Oh, so if, it's yeah. very, i've got i've got a puppy these days she's less than two and it's, it's like having a toddler all over again yeah it's so similar <laughs> And yeah. so it's, I love that. It really comes back to like, just kind of before you even approach your child, like look inwards, do a little prayer, breathe intention mm -hmm. and just, um, and I think that it's like, um, it comes back to, I suppose, self care as much as you can when you're parenting, yes, yes, because yes. when the dishes build up and, you know, yes. the stress of the day to day, it's like, have you, have you filled up your own cup enough? Am, yes. am I filled up here or am I coming from this place of an empty well, you know? Yes. 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 And it, it really is so good to hold these, these principles that you talk about, Amanda, because when things start to get, you know, messy or reactive or like we're missing each other you know with a child and um it's usually um you know it's not always but it's often is because we're stressed it's often because we've got this build up of unmet needs that we need to attend to and certainly i have noticed that and had that experience again and again and again over the years that when I notice or that blaming attitude comes in, you know, that those blaming thoughts, or that's how I always name it, you know. I notice myself feeling blaming towards my kids or one of my kids, or you know, when they were younger, was I would tend to um 
I would tend to have that blaming feeling towards my older one. And we don't like to admit that. None of us like to admit that, but we just have to get really transparent and honest with ourselves that, you know, when we notice those resentments coming in or those reactive thoughts or feelings, then bring the attention inside, bring it into your meditation, bring it into your walk, um, or, you know, maybe say to your partner or a good friend, can I just have a vent, please? Can I just, you know, just get it out of my system and could you listen for a while? And, you know, there's only certain people in this world that we can actually do that with and who can facilitate that. But if you have somebody like that, it is worth its weight in gold. I remember going through something when my daughter was 13 and, you know, just suddenly I was, you know, kind of sparking off her and, um, uh, you know, maybe she needed space or something and I'm taking it really personally and feeling quite hurt, you know, and, and I knew I was being triggered in some way and I, you know, negotiated with, with my husband, with Dan, you know, will you listen? And we went for this long walk on the beach and um, it maybe took a couple of weeks to kind of get that together and I just talked and talked and talked all about what was going on for me when I was 13 and oh boy, there was so much there. Um, and and I had big cries, you know, as I walked on the beach. I didn't care who was around. I just talked and cried and talked and cried. And I went, oh, this is what's been going on for me, you know. And it was all the stuff that I've worn the t-shirt and been done, been there. But it's a different thing again when your child is like your kids are three and four, and what was going on for you when you were three and when you were four. And there's a, I guess, a beautiful thing really that happens where what's unresolved in us relating back to that age or that stage um, often, you know, just gets sort of uh, evoked to the surface and we have to be really taking responsibility and tuning back into ourselves and um, listening to our own feelings to keep the energy between us clear. So as we're not projecting that stuff onto them. That's just got nothing to do with them. That's to do with what happened, you know, years, decades earlier. So um, it's, Really, that's why I often say, you know, peaceful parenting is like the the Olympics of parenting, isn't it, Amanda? You know, it's very easy to just throw out the orders and the threats and, the, well, if you don't do it, then I'm going to take this away and, da, 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 and, you know, overpower your children. But, you know, when parents do that, they're missing, as you say, um, that our kids are these beautiful reflectors to us and that when we are out of balance or, you know, we're not being very clear then we get that back, they show us. And, you know, in the old fashioned way, the child would maybe be a bit reactive and the parent would, would think you're being disrespectful. But, um, you know, anything like that is just missing the opportunity to really stop, slow down and tune into what's actually going on here. Why are we sparking off each other? What's going on? And sometimes we need to slow down, carve out that quality time, like really good quality time where you really play and laugh together and just spend more time together, like not just a half an hour, but give a big chunk of time, which is always hard to 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 figure that out, how we, we can do that because there's all so many jobs that need to be done every day. We don't have like heaps of mates and, and cleaners and who could just come in and do all the jobs. And it's, you know, we, we have to carve out that time. But often when we do, um, it comes out that actually there's something going on with our little one that actually they are maybe feeling jealous of their sibling or when we promised them something and then it didn't happen that we didn't even remember or we'd missed it um, or we'd forgotten. Um, but to them, it was a really, really, really big deal or our granny said something to them or this other child said something or they've started to develop a little bit of insecurity around something, you know, about parents bringing up because of who knows, you know, because somebody um, and kids themselves, they can't just, they can't just bring out those issues um, to us in the middle of a busy day as we're going, right, morning tea and snacks and now we're doing this and now we're doing that. It comes out at those times where we're really, really, really connected and they can feel that we're, we've entered their world and we're actually really, really available and we're going to respond with that, you know, real spacious, patient sensitivity.
Mm, yeah, it's like, it's kind of finding that magical hour, you know, f- mm. like it's the time before, right before sleep for my son. I, I remember the first oh. time, like, it was just actually, my daughter had already just fallen asleep and oh my gosh, it was like the tap was turned on. It was two hours of him sharing. Oh my God, it's oh, stuff yeah. that he was sharing. I was actually like, wow. bawling, like I, you know, yeah. fighting back the yeah. tears because it's like, oh <laughs> yeah. my gosh, this is what's in his little head and heart. Oh, like, sweetheart, you've oh. been carrying all this. Oh, I yeah. Know. I know. So I it's, know. And, and it's like, you know, I, I love that it's coming back to giving us parents tools and you know it's like the constant reminder because it's so easy to be in it and to forget your tools and this like I mean I think one of the biggest triggers for parents is seeing those parts of themselves that maybe they don't love the most being reflected back from them in their kids you know Um, and that that can trigger and then when you're triggered and you're in it and you're not like breathing and you know it's very easy to to yeah. not parent in the way you want to and then and then you end up being really hard on yourself because you haven't parent the way you wanted to so um mm-hmm. what what are some like other than you know the self-care what are some other kind of daily kind of reminders that us as parents can give to ourselves and i think be compassionate with ourselves when we do um not parent the way we'd want to because yeah. that's inevitable that's inevitable and it's going to show up you know yeah yeah and um, just you know when you're asking that question and i I just you know suddenly brought to mind a workshop that i ran last year um uh, then in a different part of new zealand near south island and there was one of the moms who came up to me afterwards and she said you know genevieve thank you so much for your work and it it was actually a self-healing um workshop for parents you know and and she said at the moment, I'm actually just reading your articles because I'm so, so sensitive to reading anything that triggers my huge kind of self-blame and self-shame. And, and you know, she's so, so, so sensitive to um, not getting it right and getting it wrong. And, oh, my gosh, am I doing harm? And, and I am. Um, and. And, and, and that for me was like the best compliment that anybody could ever give me is that I'm managing mm. to convey um, to the parents who are reading or listening or coming to workshops or whatever that, you know, when you're not being the parent that you want to be, I really get that you're, str- you're suffering, you're struggling, and this is really hard for you. And you don't need somebody to shame you about that because actually, you know, you're carrying it very heavily, you know, and this is obviously the parents. I'm not saying that there isn't, um, you know, you know, a lot of parents with narcissistic personality disorder, and you know, this, that they're, um, that every parent is really exploring. Um, but I, I guess um, the majority of, of us are and um and so we need to be very very compassionate so basically what i was getting at there is um you know read the the articles of mine and people like me that you have found that is going to bring you back to your heart is going to bring you back to remembering that what it's all about is the connection your connection with yourself as a mom, as a dad, as a teacher, as a grandparent, and your your connection with your child, and as you so beautifully talked about in the beginning, you know your child's connection with themselves. So we need to have we need to surround ourselves with that because we've all got those voices um, from those years and years and years of conditioning during childhood and the you know childhood hypnosis that that's going to come out and that's not so compassionate that's harsh and so we're trying to counter that and really uh, often it feels like a bit like driving on the opposite side of the road you know if we can't just allow our first nature um from childhood to take over we need to be uh, surrounding ourselves and bringing into our days and into our lives that which reminds us of who we really are, who our child really is, what our values are, what we're aiming for, what it's all about. And, you know, it's it's not necessarily even parenting information. It can be, you know, um, 
yeah, it can be, you know, whoever your spiritual leader or teachers are. Or, um, you know, for me, Amanda, I have had very, very strong practices in my life and in my parenting life, which I have had to have. And so I really recommend that, that I think we all need that. We all need to slowly but surely develop those practices that, um, that, that bring us back. And for some people, it's their yoga or going for their walks in nature or their art or they're putting on certain music and singing, whatever it is that will make you smile and make you laugh and make you cry and loosen you up and bring you back to remembering the, I guess, what's really, really, really important. We all need to have that in our lives. And for me, I've been meditating. That's been a big one for me since I was, um, yeah, for, since I was 19. So I've been meditating for 30 years now. And that really is my ace card as a parent. And alongside the meditation where I sit and close my eyes and, you know, drop into that place where everything just slowly but surely settles, 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 slows down. Um, also practicing mindfulness, which is about, as I go through my day, which I was speaking to a while ago, really, that as you're approaching that situation with your child or you need to have that conversation with them because you just discovered that they've just you know found that sugary snack and you're just about to dish up the lunch or whatever it is and you've got that little bit of an emotional reaction going on and and so we need to be able to um i believe practice mindfulness which is which is actually just self-witnessing and noticing noticing what's going on inside of us noticing that our heart rate has just suddenly really sped up and that we're getting hot under the collar etc so everybody has their different ones and as i'm working with individual clients you know we'll talk about what is it that brings you back to balance where's your happy place and we have to build that into our lives it's very easy as parents and um and i i i don't want to exclude dads from this but i, I will say that you know us us males and females have got different gender stereotyping imprinted into us and uh, and for a lot of us um, women and mothers then there's very very strong imprinting to just do 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 give 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 and you know be the martyr and it's a lot of people reflect to me that what they love about what I teach is that it not only gives them permission to focus on the self-care, but it actually really wakens them up to the fact that they have to. It's their responsibility. It's kind of a bit irresponsible not to do it when you realize um, that it's the only way to really maintain that, that harmony and balance throughout the days. And what, what lots of people do, and I get lots of photographs <laughs> sent to me of people go, Generally, this is my kitchen or this is my bathroom, this is my bedroom. And they've, they've got, like, say, you know, particularly people who do my e courses, and they've got these cheat sheets and summary sheets and, the, and articles and quotes just pinned up all over the place um, because uh, they are, they're trying to bring it into their psyche. You know, they go to the toilet and go, oh, yes, that's right. You know, he's not, he's not giving me a hard time, you know, on purpose. He's not purposely trying to press my buttons. He's just, um, he's just needing what he needs and, you know, he is doing his best. And I think we, we need those little mantras, you know, a bit like affirmations that we can just draw on immediately. And, you know, that's a good one. It's like my child is doing their best. Just when we are struggling with whatever the behavior is, oh my gosh, here we go again. We've got the battle. It's time to have a shower. We do, do this every day. You know, it should be routine, but oh, ho, ho, my child's digging their heels in and, you know, why are they making my life so difficult? I've had such a big day and I, I've done all these things for them. And, you know, just- And that, that really is them coming, that's kind of them yeah. coming into victim, isn't it? Like, why are they doing this yeah. to me? And it's like, no, yeah. they're, they're just being yeah. them. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I had this poem that's up right. and, and I loved it so much. And I, I, I'll have to put the author of the poem in the show notes, but it was, it, the poem was basically, if we want to teach our children about love, 
they have a witness us being loving with ourselves. If we want to teach them about compassion, they've got to witness us being that with ourselves. And um, thank you so much for sharing all that. And, and I love hearing it's like, first of all, you're like, we've got to be honest with ourselves, like really, really honest. What are the triggers? You know, looking back to those times in our life, um, witnessing you know how we're reacting or how you know and i love your example of like you made a lovely dinner and they're reaching for you know something that you don't want them to eat and yeah. you, like you just notice like you just get triggered versus like breathing mm -hmm. and you know um and then like self-care and the other thing i think is so important is you know you hear like oh uh the connection for the child with the parent is so important it's so important like but actually the connection for the parent with the child is equally as important for us like you know it the is. child you know it's child happy place as well. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely and um there's been so many amazing points that you're you're bringing up um the next one you talked about the gender type you know between the mm -hmm. father and the mother and um and i'd love to look at this because i mm, it's a big uh, <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah. i just it just like so basically for me uh i don't know like the inner child that's just so fun for me and I actually yeah. love playing full out with my kids and actually just going oh. into their world and like we'll yeah. run up the forest through the fields and honestly like that's bliss for me right oh <laughs> gorgeous Yes. Yeah, but, but I would say where my not so strong point was and, and this would probably be my husband's complaint is like playing with them connecting with them being in their world with them but what's really i've really had to kind of consciously you know step up to because you talk about being centered find our own composure but the empowerment so like for me it's easy to play in the world to be with them but then when it's like um the boundaries that was the harder place for me to learn to step into and that would have been uh, one of my husband like his complaints well the first one was more self-care more self-care more self-care but his next one was mm -hmm. you know nice. the boundaries for me and because he feels then if I don't have the strong boundaries then when you know he's with them and I'm not there they're more about okay the inner child let's have fun let's play but it's like the boundary so he feels that he's more yeah, yeah. left with that side of things so what yeah. would any advice yeah. that you have there yeah so he feels like he's he's the boundary setter and the um, you know, which would be maybe like less popular. <laughs> uh, and so I, I guess I'll, I can talk about, you know, how to hold the boundaries and set the limits in a way while maintaining the connection. And as I was saying earlier, that's the, that's the hardest and that's what takes the most skill. It's, um, it's easy to sway towards authoritarian, just do it. And it's, and it's easier to become super permissive where, you're walking on eggshells, so you're basically just avoiding saying no or avoiding avoiding hold the limits. It's, a, it's bedtime. Oh, okay. Yeah, you just say okay, okay. And um, and so first thing I want to say is that I try to avoid um, giving advice on what the boundaries should be um, because you know that parents might might be quite happy with their kid going into the going to the pantry and getting the um, that snack just before uh, just before dinner or whatever um so you know one person might be okay with that and and so it's not really for me to say kind of what the limits should and shouldn't be because it really is a values thing you know it depends on the values that you have as a parent and um, i will say that it's it is really important to hold boundaries because boundaries are a really important part of healthy happy um functional relationships um i was talking with a um a client's mind this week who's 19 and just really you know talking about the the dynamics between himself and his girlfriend and um you know like going right into how they can manage it when when one of them isn't happy with what the other one is doing and how to express that in a way that's more likely to have those needs met and um you, you know so it, 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 we want our children to get this from the beginning you know actually i i said to this my client i said hey did you learn this stuff in school you know learning about sexual health and consent and he said no none of that oh gosh that's shocking but anyway so so coming back to to our kids boundaries are really important because if they 
if they learn to understand and respect and not be scared and intimidated by people saying no, um, you know, I mean, I'm not necessarily the word no, but in all forms of, of no, you know, I don't want to do that, or I'm not happy with that, or no, not now, or um, no, I'm not going to let you hurt your sister, or, um, you know, if they if they get that training from us and we're holding those limits and those boundaries, they get really good themselves at understanding that other people have their limitations, have their boundaries and, and how to negotiate it. And it's also, of course, how we respond to them when they say no, and they say, no, I don't want you to, to brush my hair. And, um, you know, I found that incredibly difficult to let that go. You know, uh, you probably relate to that, Amanda, because I'm, I'm not assuming you had a similar upbringing to me. But, you know, um, certainly yeah, when I grew up, that, that that child's hair must be brushed and they must be wearing their shoes and they must be nicely dressed. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas actually I had to really examine myself and go, no, does that really fit with my values? Like, OK, let's go to to the mall or the, the the grannies or whatever and you can wear that you know that you wear the pajamas in the middle of the day the pajamas <laughs> and oh, you know, and, and 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 but it's about you know that's where it comes back to the values but then there's another situation where it is actually really important that they that they do get dressed you know like back in ireland we're going to you know, a christening, then, um, you know, I wasn't going to allow <laughs> their pajamas and, the, and because it, w- it was other people, they wouldn't get it. They would, they would not get that. And it's, you know, you're yeah, balancing yeah, because you, that, the cultural expectations and respect. I know, I know. And there's a balance in that, like honoring the child's spirit. And I, you know, I've had to really look at that myself, like honoring their free spirit and letting them, you know, you know in nature just be you know and just have fun yeah. and explore yeah. and then it's like uh oh society says this and also it's my job you know or as as a being a guide to these beautiful beings to actually let them know what society expects so that's that's always a little challenging yeah. for me okay this yeah. is society ones yeah. but it's up to me to share this with you and i want you to be a free spirit but this is going to actually in the end like end up being to your disadvantage if you don't know these things exactly exactly that's right the socialization is really really important and so um a classic one that comes up here is um is you know the the the, the whole manners thing you know and a lot of people who move away from the authoritarian and they're doing the, the peaceful and gentle parenting then they think oh you know i shouldn't tell my child that they should say um thank you and and please and you know but but i think there's um that there's a way that we can we can help them with the socialization and understanding what the um, social ex- the expectations and the limits and the boundaries are the you know the ones that we actually do value there's a lot that, that we may decide no i don't i don't agree with that but the ones that you do kind of um want to hold there's a way that we can do it without being shaming without being punitive um, without you know humiliating him by saying where's your manners and what do you say to granddad when he gives you that and you know that that's uh, obviously that's not very um well, I think ironically, it's it's kind of rude to do that, you know, because we wouldn't say that to granny or granddad, would we? We wouldn't say, you know, say please to your granddaughter when you ask, you know, um, we would yeah. find a more tactful way of, 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 of expressing what we need to express. And so, you know, that tact and diplomacy, I think, is a really big part of it. So coming back to the limits and boundaries, I think it's really, really, really important not to be afraid of holding those limits you know you may you so some people they they can put their child to bed their child can go to bed at whatever time and they're homeschooling and or it's the summer holidays and the child's going to sleep in in the morning and they're going to get their 10 11 hours or whatever it is that their child needs and the next day is going to be you know happy and fine and then there's other kids if they don't get to sleep by a certain time they're going to wake up a cock crow anyway Mm -hmm. and the next day it's going to be right off and in that case it's not really kind or fair to your child to just like let them stay up till all hours because um because you're not exactly setting them up for success and the next day it's going to be difficult and um so it is important to 
hold to those limits and boundaries and uh, and not be worried or afraid that it's squashing their spirit or it's shaming them because as long as you're giving them lots and lots of opportunities to have a say to have choice to have autonomy you know do you want to do you want to wear you know these jammies or these jammies or um you know giving them choices then and, and hearing them and respecting them and when they protest or when they complain or when they, whatever it is that we really listen, we tune in, we use the act of listening, we reflect back, we show them that we're really listening and really caring. You know, these are all ways that we are giving them the message all the time, all day, every day that your voice is being heard, your voice matters. And when we're holding the limits, say they want to go on the TV and you don't want them to go on the TV and they don't know that, you know, they they just watch TV for three hours in the morning. They don't know that there's all of this dopamine um, receptors going crazy in the brain and multiplying in the brain. And that all kind of adds up to this addictive effect and makes them more prone to addictions later on. And, you know, there's an awful lot that they don't know about the effect of screens and sugar and all these things that are not natural. It's not what, you know, it's not what nature provided. So there is a lot that... That, that we're holding that they're not and that we have that responsibility to hold that limit and so say they want to watch tv uh, all morning uh, can Just i ask a question them, though yeah. what is your thoughts yeah. um because you know sometimes i wonder am i over sharing but of actually educating because you know whether it comes to sugar yeah. or tv like my son you know he's Absolutely. five and a half and it's like you know yeah you know, oh, sugar, you know, it's so easy for people, children to be addicted to. And it's like, well, here's what's really good for your body and educating. What, what do you think is like too much to, yeah. to share as far as TV, you know, like you're saying what it does and how it can create addictions and stuff or, or sugar, um, not to, yeah. I suppose, not to stress them out, but to empower them. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I really believe in that. And that's certainly always been the angle. And I had quite a few um, people, relatives in particular, um, who, who, you know, really believed that, um, that my children were going to rebel because I, I was so, you know, what they would have seen as being a, um, kind of too extreme in the food police because, you know, we're, I'm really, really into my um, health food and my nutrition. And, um, you know, my mom got into all of that when I was a teenager. Well, not all of that, but, you know, at least whole food when I was a teenager. And so I appreciate that. It kind of switched me into it. And so it's a really, really big part of my value system. And I've self-educated, you know, it's one of my interests. I just read those books and watch those documentaries. And so um, I think the more educated you become, then the the, the stronger responsibility you have to um to protect your children because because actually everybody draws the line nobody's going to allow their child to drink bleach you know but <laughs> to a very very extreme example yeah but where do where you do, do you draw the line but when you see the sugar to be um you know to be as as damaging as it is then and and so i'd say there was some people believe that my kids would just they would just go crazy and go the other way and they'd be into McDonald's and all the rest. But, you know, they're, it's, it's actually uh, the, the complete opposite that they share with me their value of, um, of food and nutrition because I have educated them all along and because, you know, they grew up vegetarian, but they each had a time where they wanted to eat meat. And, um, and I was like, sure, you know, of course, you know, as opposed to, no, you can't. And mm -hmm. then how does your body feel? And then, you know, they both were sick afterwards and, you know, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the next time, oh, I want to have that sausage. It's like, okay, so I'm just reminding you how you felt the last time. Are you sure you want to do this? And, you know, and so it's, it's that tuning in and um, educating them. Reminding. Also in a way that, <laughs> reminding and educating them in a way that's that they don't feel like we're bombarding them and lecturing them you know so probably when they've just had that sugary snack just before dinner and we've just got a bit wound up about it that's probably not the best time for us to remind us of to remind them of the bad things the sugar does to their brain because we're not going to be able to do it in a way where the 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 connection is really good you know so it's at the the calm connected relaxed times are always the best times for to have those conversations um, mm -hmm. and I believe even all the way through to you know when the teenager is 
wanting to try alcohol or whatever, again, you know, educate them and go, okay, sweetheart, I can't, you know, um, I can't make you not do that, but will you please watch these um, YouTube clips that I choose that, you know, and, and sit down and have a conversation with me. So is there more educators? So it, it is about giving them the, the information and, and your question, Amanda, about how much is too much, your child will know, you know, the, your child will show you, they will know what's too much for them and they'll just get distracted and run away and, and go and play and do something else. And they're just showing you, okay, that's as much as I can take in right now. Yeah, and then you might yeah. come back to it later and go, hey, did you understand what I was saying? Is that, you know, is that interesting? Make it visual, you know, show them maybe, you know, find an animated thing on um video that you that's going to make it easier for them to access that information um and but and also i have to come back to saying that even if they don't understand why we're holding the limit um why we're saying no to them just spending the morning watching tv uh we don't have to get them to agree because that's not what boundaries are about you know we um even if they can't agree don't agree don't see our point they think we're a big meanie you know i remember my daughter when she was about three and a half or four and she went through a phase it was the cutest thing ever and she would say you're ruining my whole life <laughs> you know when she wasn't like that something and um, you know it's, it's very very hard isn't it to hold limits and your child is just seeing you to be a big meanie because they don't they can't get it but what we can do is we they're okay they're not allowed to do that or to have that or you know we don't feel comfortable about it but they are allowed to be upset they are allowed to protest they're allowed to be um to complain about it um they're you know they're allowed to try and negotiate with us you know whereas when we were growing up it was just a no and no don't you dare talk back or how dare you um uh, yeah, they're they're allowed to have their emotions, you know. Yeah, and, and yeah. what I what I will say as well is, you know, um, when you do like find your your peaceful parenting um, in boundary setting, it's so empowering because, like, I remember I used to feel a little like uh, I I used to feel a little lost when I needed to set the boundaries, and what, since I've like found a really healthy way that feels good in my heart to set boundaries it's yeah. just it just feels so like oh my gosh i've got this i like i don't feel like that every second of every day but it's yeah. like this feels really good and they actually want to as you come back to what you said earlier they want the harmonious peaceful environment yeah. just as much as we do um and i have one last question for you and yeah. i feel like i could talk to you all day all week all year you are so amazing um um, oh, and one other thing in farm is, is yeah, oh, it is, yeah. it is. And, yeah. you know, one other thing about, you know, setting boundaries, if you find that you are recovering people pleaser or you're people pleaser, that's, oh, yeah. you know, that's that, that for me, because that's, that's what I used to be. And, you know, it's a yes, daily thing to so, work on that. That's yeah. where like, you have to be like, no, this is for the, the highest good of the children for me, yes. the family, uh, you yes. know, them yes. as they grow older. And then it's so empowering. And then I love, so this is uh, the last question you were just said a moment ago, you know, they're allowed to have their, their feelings. They're allowed to have mm -hmm. their emotions. And I know this is like a huge question, but just, I think allowing them to have that. And I think, you know, my daughter, you know, at that age between two and three, when they, those emotions are so big and so strong. So and they, <laughs> I know. And so I think my one last question is when those, I don't even like the word, I don't know if I love the word tantrum, but like they're just overwhelmed mm -hmm. by their emotions and they're just yeah. like, they're kind of inconsolable. So it's like, you want to pick them up and you want to hold them, but they're just not in the space for that. Um, yeah. Like how, how does one, you know, when they're having that like overload of emotions mm -hmm. and it might just be, you know, you're cutting an apple and they wanted a star shape and you've done a, you've done a square, you know, it could be something like that. Yeah. How do you handle yeah. uh, or like support them when they're in that overflow of emotions? Yeah. Do you give them space for it? Do you like try to, you know, but they're kind of like, it's like, it feels like they need space, you know? Mm, mm. Um, oh yeah, it's a great question. And this is huge, but I'll try to be um, succinct because I know we must be getting, uh, um, close to the end have we, have, are we into our last couple of minutes yeah yeah but yeah, just like okay. however you know i know it's I've a huge question yeah. 
um yeah no it's oh yeah it's such a good one so um yeah and as i was saying they, they're you know they're allowed to have their emotion allowed to be upset they're allowed to um and they do become overwhelmed you're right you know they just reach these points where the frustration is overwhelming the frustrations can be so overwhelming um and and then, as you say, it can be something really, really small because it's like it's the blue cup, cup instead of the red cup or you've cut their sandwich the wrong way or whatever. And, and, and suddenly it's the, the end of the world as you know it, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, you usually like the sandwiches this way. What is going on? Um, but often it is, it's just the last draw moment and there's been this thing and that thing and maybe they haven't had enough sleep or maybe something happened where somebody got kind of annoyed with them and they got frustrated and scared and uh, or they saw something that was you know we just don't know all these things that impact them and the frustrations build up the emotions build up and then suddenly there's just something provides that trigger and that last straw and it's it's um it's a pretext really often to cry um to cry as in to let it out because children are born with this most beautiful natural us humans are born with this beautiful natural innate ability to bring ourselves back to balance to heal to get the bad feelings out to get the stress the shock the icky the shame the the overwhelm to get it out of our systems and one of the main ways of doing it is crying and and indeed tantrums like where they're crying and raging um it's a it's a hugely cathartic experience for the child it's not always cathartic sometimes the child can be there's there's a tantrum where they're really fighting and there's a tantrum where they're really releasing and if, if you get what i mean and if your child is is in that tantrum where they're actually you know probably maybe being aggressive or whatever then the aim needs to be to bring them to a cathartic experience that's just releasing and for that to happen they they need to know that we get that this is really really hard for them so the last thing we want to do is to label or judge that tantrum to be misbehavior or manipulation because um because look at the child look at their face look at the anguish look what they're going through and now try and imagine ourselves going through that and whoa that would be you know huge crisis in our lives and um, to be going through you know that intensity of emotion so they need the child needs to know that we as the parent really get how hard this is for them no matter how hard it is for us you know we're the adults we actually do have to suck it up you know and um come back to our own frustrations, exasperation, deal with that ourselves later on. This is a moment where our child is in immense emotional distress and, and, and it's all too much for them. And um, there's you know, a parent educator here, Nathan McCary Wallace, and he, talk, he says, when children feel bad, they can think they are bad, young children. And I really love that as a good reminder that um, and also that the child, when they're in that, they don't know when it's going to end. Even adults, when they go through intense emotional uh, feelings, they can they can forget that they didn't always feel so angry or so sad or so full of grief, or, and they can find it hard to hold that they're going to feel good again. So we need to we need to show them that we get how hard this is for them. Often children are pushing the parents away because they're super, super, super sensitive to their parents trying to shut them down, trying to stop them from expressing what they're expressing, whereas they can sense that I need to get this out of my system, like, you know, to be sorry for the analogy, but like vomiting when they have food poisoning, you know, there's something, something toxic yeah. inside of them. They're trying to get out. And if they sense that the parent is trying to distract them, shut them down, um, then they will fight their parent, which, which is awful because it's a opposing attachment needs there because it's the child's attachment needs is to be, have that proximity, that closeness, and with their caregiver, with their attachment figure, when they're experiencing distress. So that kind of answers your, your question, I think, about, you know, do we, do we leave them to it? Because, yeah, we allow them to be upset, but we don't just say, okay, be upset, you know, I'm going to mm -hmm. cook the dinner and I'll come back to you later. Um, 
and sometimes children you know ask for that space and often you know it's a lot to unpack there with individual parents and and it's hard to kind of give a formula to it but often the child has learned that their parent um doesn't cope very well and and then the child can't cope with the fact that the parent isn't coping with mm -hmm. them being upset do you know like mm -hmm. if if you or i are really upset you know if i'm really upset and um and I, I, and I sense that my husband, he's not coping with me being upset, then, ah, oh, that's a lot for me to have to deal with, you know? And, um, you know, so as adults, when that closest person who you want the comfort and reassurance from uh, can't, can't deal with it, then, then really the child can sense that they're having to deal with this whole package of um, the opposite of harmony, but conflicting energy. Um, between you that's that's incredibly hard so they're forced to pro push the parents away because they want to protect themselves from the extra distress that that's causing them and you know well-meaning parents but but most of us have been conditioned we were conditioned to believe that the child is um, misbehaving and we can't let them away with this we can't let the child away with acting like this look how they're acting and there's this judgment and and then it's missing really tuning in to hang on what's my child feeling whoa oh my gosh poor little sweetheart oh honey you know when we tune in to what's going on for them then we find a way of managing our own internal process and and the emotions are being triggered for us in reaction so i maybe mention an article a couple of articles because this is a huge subject and so just to give people more resources so i've got an article called um Oh, what is this? Um, go away. Um, what to do when your child won't let you connect? And in that, I try to unpack that question of when the child is pushing the parent away, and and it's not just as simple as just be with them, and um, no matter what, as you say, they probably don't want to be held. Amanda, you mentioned that, which is a really good point because often they don't because all that energy is going out. It's a catharsis. They need to kind of let their arms and legs flail but what often is really helpful for the child is if we can let our child push against us and um, so maybe you know that we offer our the palms of our hands and we say you know see if it push me push me backwards and um it depends on where they're at in the tantrum you know if they're at up at a nine or a ten you won't be able to even communicate that but if they're at a six or a seven um, you may be able to, um, or often that the child, especially little kids, like, you know, your kids, three, four, they, that the feet will go towards the parent, you know, they'll push the parent with their feet and the parent can, can read that to be aggressive, but actually often it's just, they yeah, need a that, form of connection, I suppose. Huh? Yeah, the connection and they need to push against you because if you've got some big frustration stuck inside of you and you push your hands against the wall and um, it's going to bring that all that frustration from your belly and turn it into a big growl you know it's just a, it's a way of getting that um, energy out of the body if that makes sense I feel like I'm kind of getting a bit too technical <laughs> but, no that, that um, makes that that makes absolute sense and um you know sometimes I say to my daughter I know like this is really like hard because I I just kind of want to and I sometimes see an expression in her face like oh she, she knows this is hard, you know, like, so is there any mm. words that you would use? I, I know yeah. sometimes there isn't even yeah. space for words. It's more like just saying, you know, push against me. I'm here, you know, uh, yeah. no matter what, yeah. whether you're happy, sad, you don't have to always be happy. You don't always, yeah. you know, it's like, I'm going to be here for you no matter what. So it sounds like that's what yeah. you're saying. By yeah, it is. It is. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. It's okay, sweetheart. Just get it out. Just let it all out. That's it. Let it all out. Oh, and um, using that really heartfelt, empathetic tone of voice, you know, it's like, oh, sweetheart, this is so hard for you. Sometimes they need us to talk about what it is that they think it's all about. You know, they think it's all about how we cut the sandwich because they don't know that there was this big backlog that was building up over the last week um, or there was this something a bit traumatic that they experienced. They don't know that that's what's going on. They just know you cut the, you, you cut the sandwich this way and it was the end of the world. So, you know, we might need to start there and go, 
oh, you really didn't want me to, to cut the sandwich, did you? Or you really wanted the blue cup or, oh, it's so frustrating for you that we don't have any cornflakes this morning. Oh, this is so hard for you. And you're thinking, it's not really about this. She doesn't normally really care, but you know, that can be a really good place. That was her. Start. That was that was his or her tipping point in that moment. Yeah, tipping point exactly. So just showing them that oh, this is so hard for you, and I'm here, and take your time, and and also to bring in oh, I promise you, you'll feel so much better after you get it all out, mm. and you will oh. feel better again, sweetheart. I promise you, but just get it all out. That's it. Big tears. Oh, that's it push it all out and and then that language becomes internalized for them and then I've seen my kids you know speaking to other younger kids when they've been upset and using that sort of language oh saying, that's, that's going to be a beautiful a moment for you <laughs> oh it's gorgeous actually just um just very briefly, my son's just had his 21st so we had the big 21st and there were speeches and slideshow and all of that and auntie got up you know one of his aunties my husband's sister and and she told this story and she says oh jen and dan you probably know this which i actually i didn't know it and she was looking after both my kids the younger one got upset my little girl got really upset she hurt herself playing some game and and um, and the auntie was thinking oh gosh i have to deal with this but actually um Oshin brought her over um you know, to the sideline or what outside the situation. And she thought, okay, yeah, he's just, you know, he's delivering the child to me. Isn't that sweet? But he sat down beside her and he said, Oh, you hurt yourself. And, oh, you're so <laughs> upset. And, oh, Aisha, just have a big cry. That's mm. it. <gasps> yeah. And, and it's been gorgeous, as you say, just beautiful seeing how the kids mm. have internalized that and, and also that they can see, People in the world who are aggressive or whatever, they've got all of this stuff inside of them that they can't get out. And it's not that it makes injustices okay um, or not wrong, but they've got a whole different, um, you know, bigger picture around it. Mm. Absolutely. And um, oh my God, as I said, I could keep talking for hours and hours and mm -hmm. hours, but like everyone just has to take your courses and uh, read your articles and, and listen to your meditations and all the amazing stuff you put out there. And I know you've mentioned a couple of times, like upbringing in, in, in Ireland, you know, as a Catholic or whatever, you know, not that religion is about it, but it used to yeah. be very much so. Let's just push those emotions down, put a smile on your face, oh, you know, and it's, yeah. it's like, it's like no total, total and mm. utter reprogramming. And then, oh. you know, when you see that in your child, it's like, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's a whole yeah. nother, a whole nother conversation. Oh, we could talk oh. for hours. Yeah. Later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I am calling Catholic Irish conditioning, yeah. <laughs> and the guilt and the whatever else. But anyway, yeah. I am so grateful. You are amazing. Amazing, amazing. And I think one, one, one final question. How can we support you? Oh, oh that's a lovely question. And I guess, um, you know, I, I just don't have a salesy bone in my body. You know, it's not, it's not my thing. But, <laughs> but the reality, just because you ask that question, say, well, you know, I just want people to know that anything that they, you know, just to buy a download or um, join membership or anything like that or buy books through my website you know it's just like a little affiliate thing it's like tiny but um but anything like that is supporting the peaceful parent institute and we do have huge visions to reach more and more and more and more people and to you know to be really getting right out through the mainstream you know when i started the peaceful parent institute about 12 years ago peaceful parenting wasn't even a thing you know it hadn't you know people hadn't even heard of it and it just felt really brave to be even using that term and now there's peaceful parenting this that and the other everywhere which is which is just fantastic so the change is happening and um and so and so yes by by just even coming on the facebook page and commenting on an article go you know this is really important and this is what like even that comment on a on a facebook on my facebook page or in a group is all part of advocacy actually isn't it absolutely because yeah it's advocacy because it's it's um it's putting it out there guys this is the way to go this is normal this is what we have to do um yeah and so people can just 
find me through Facebook, The Way of the Peaceful Parent, or my website is um, peacefulparent.com. Or just put Genevieve Simpringham in the search and you'll, you'll find me. Um, and so, yeah, so, but, but there's mm. dozens of articles there. Thank you so much for being here today. This was just my honor and this amazing wisdom and truth needs to just spread to as many as possible. So I'm going to put all this incredible, your articles, your website, your Facebook page, everything in the show notes. And um, let us know when you're coming to Ireland and America to do some live retreats or workshops. Oh, yes, actually, I'm going to be there in, in July. But yeah, it's been so gorgeous to be on the show. I've loved chatting with you, Amanda. And I could tell, you know, you and I could talk for hours and hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. It is. It's beautiful work. It's a beautiful way of parenting. And, um, and as you say, you know, just as much for us. It's so satisfying when there's that gorgeous harmony and connection and trust and openness in those relationships. And, and I just, as a last note, I just want to assure all the parents out here of the little kids and you're really doing the hard, hard yards now. It is not easy to be, you know, to be so mindful and patient, but I promise you that it's going to be so worth it because the whole teenage rebellion thing that they say is unavoidable, it totally and utterly oh. is avoidable. And, um, and that's, you know, that's my experience, but not just my experience. And um, that's the same with, with people who parent in this way all along that, and um, you're going to have the beautiful open lines of communication and trust for years and years, forevermore. So it's so worth it. Mm, so thank worth you, it. Thank, thank you, thank you. You are amazing. Thank you. Now, I would love to hear from you. What are some of your greatest parenting success stories? Are tools that have been supportive in having a deeper connection with your child? Please share as your story might be just what someone needs to hear to really make a difference in their family's life. Thanks, beloveds, for joining us today. Please come over to themandacons.com to continue the conversation and get access to all my podcasts, blogs, and videos. Did you enjoy this podcast? If so, please subscribe to the Amanda Cons podcast on iTunes and leave us a five-star review. Feel free to pass this podcast on to your friends. That helps us get incredible guests to share their secrets for an inspired and joyful life. If you want more great resources, come over to amandacons.com and join my mailing list for all my latest content. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, I'm sending love